Good evening, everyone. I'm Ava Castleton, Manager of Alum Events at Girl Scouts of the USA, and I'm so excited to present to you our Campfire Chat, hosted by the Girl Scout Network, Work-Life Integration in the Time of COVID-19, featuring panelists Lauren Smith-Brody, author of The Fifth Trimester, Sarah LaFleur, CEO at MM LaFleur, in conversation with our moderator, Anne Choquette, former editor-in-chief of Seventeen and author of The Big Life. Our incredible speakers will be discussing how the pandemic impacts our fragile home ecosystems, jobs, friendships, romantic relationships, and families, and how we can make it all work. Before we get started, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about the Girl Scout Network. We're a powerful community of adults, Girl Scout alums and supporters from across the country who believe in preparing girls to be the leaders of the future and supporting each other today. If you're reconnecting with us now, welcome back into the Girl Scout sisterhood. Our campfire chats are hosted virtually and broadcast live, where successful women talk with us about the ways they advocate for more female leadership and continue to cultivate careers on the front lines of change. I'm thrilled to introduce you to our moderator, Anne Choquette, author of The Big Life, who has been heralded by visionaries like Issa Rae as the, a phenomenal champion for women. Anne will be taking us on this journey over the next hour, and I'll be sharing your answer. So don't be afraid to ask, and don't forget to tag social posts with hashtag Campfire Chats and at Girl Scouts. Thank you so much again for joining us. Anne, the mic is all yours. Hello. Hello. Well, hello, first of all, to my beautiful, amazing fellow panelists here, Sarah LaFleur and Lauren Brody, who I am honored to be in conversation with. Um, and thank you so much to the Girl Scouts. Um, Ava, thank you for a wonderful introduction. I just want to take one very brief moment at the beginning of this to say how honored I am to be here with the Girl Scouts. Um, I was a brownie growing up in Littleton, Colorado, um, but I sold Girl Scout cookies. Um, and this year I bought Girl Scout cookies. They are all already eaten. Um, <laughs> and I really just wanna say how thrilled I am that the Girl Scouts are still bringing women together in a great sense of community and really building confidence for girls and women of all ages. I think that these campfire chats are a wonderful experience. Um, the skills that I learned as a Girl Scout, um, macrame maybe not so much, um, <laughs> but certainly the sense of community and sisterhood that was um, really fostered um, in my troop uh, is something that I really, it's one of the values that I hold true today. And actually, um, just really one quick amazing plug and thank you for the Girl Scouts. The fact that I learned macrame as a brownie and that now Girl Scouts are learning coding. I think that that is an amazing sign of the times and also mm -hmm. um, incredibly um, rewarding hope for the future. <laughs> I don't know if macrame has totally been a been a huge part of my adult life, but maybe the, the attention to detail <laughs> Maybe, some of the, maybe maybe a little moment of self care to really focus on something small that you can only um, that requires all of your attention to get perfect and excellent. Maybe some of those skills transfer. In any case, um, we are here today to talk about work life balance. But um, if any of you know anything that you've ever heard me say before, I think that work life balance is a sham. I've been saying it for years. There is no. Um, there is not even any idea of like having it all. That is not something that even is something aspirational anymore. It's all pressure and no sense of possibility. And um, when we talk about work-life balance, there this idea as if um, your work and your life should come perfectly into balance together. And um, that just doesn't exist. We are all work all the time, all life all the time. And now we are literally all work, all life, all work, all life, that the walls between the two, anything that was there before has completely disintegrated. We are on top of each other. We are on top of each other as a family, with our children, in our 
um, people are working out where they are working and sleeping where they are working. It's like there is no, you couldn't get a moment's peace or even a tiny little breath between the two if you tried. Um, and so um, to have you both here talking about uh, what do we do? How do we keep our ambitions burning to keep us moving forward? How do we keep from losing our minds? From, from completely burning out and tipping over the edge? Um, and how do we not, um, and how do we like, how do we not give in to the anxiety and frankly, a little bit of a sense of hopelessness that is brewing in the world? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I wanna start with you, Lauren. Talk to me about what are the things that we have to change, the expectations that have to change for ourselves now? Um, first of all, I, I echo your thanks to the Girl Scouts and to their evolved and amazing mission. And um, although I have to say, my mom, um, I asked my mom last night if she could dig up a picture of me in my brownie uniform from Austin, Texas, from 19, sometime between 1983 and 1986. And she texted it back to me and, uh, and then said, wouldn't it be so great if we could all just still earn badges? And yeah, yeah I think, like, can you imagine the badges that, that we I did all- did everything for the badges. Right? I love that. <laughs> when I think of the badges that, that I have personally accomplished in the last six weeks, that, that is like a huge what, stash of badges. Mm -hmm. um, wait, what was your question, And I'm sorry. Your question was um, how, part what... Of, part of what we're really wrestling with is the expectation, right? Yes, the, the expectations, yes. And so what are the expectations that have to change? How do we have to change how we think about work and life in this time? So I think, you know, the three of us have talked probably a lot over the last couple of years in the work that we do about the fact that this generation of women puts more expectations on ourselves out of out of ability and out of, you know, our access to the education that we've had and all of the opportunities that, that we've had in some ways have bitten us in the butt because we think we have to do all of those things all the time. And, you know, we can stand on mountains and say, you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all. And now we're in this crisis where actually like we, in some ways we are doing all of the things. And in other ways we're failing left and right. And yet there is also this kind of, wonderful transparency of like flawed existence that we're all a lot more comfortable sharing um, or at least it, it seems to have happened very rapidly that we've gotten more comfortable with the fact that our kids are going to bust into meetings. I, I would be shocked if one of my children or my dog doesn't run in here at some point in the next hour um, and and that that's going to have to be okay because otherwise you're not getting anything of me, right? Like this is what we're having to sort of communicate to our families that if you want, you know, mom, wife, person in this family to contribute in all the ways that I do, you're gonna have to see that my work is pretty visible and work if you want me to do this job now. And if I'm gonna be able to do it, you're gonna have to be okay with seeing my life. And so the expectations finally have kind of been changed for us in a way that I think ultimately can be a positive. I don't wanna you know, shine like a big silver light of hope on you know, this is all glorious and wonderful for everybody. No, but there, there are some things that will evolve more quickly, I think in terms of workplace culture and work-life integration that we're going to take a decade are now gonna happen in six months. And I think that could be a good thing. I mean, I've been saying that the things that I have learned from millennials are transparency and freedom from the office and frankly like we suddenly got transparency and freedom from the office like you have to have it right. it doesn't no asking for it um there's there's no eye rolling at like oh, millennials right there aren't they so entitled yes we're entitled because it's your life and it's your work and it's all the time um but the what about the personal expectation Lauren, tell me a little bit about the ways in which like that idea that because we can do it all, we should do it all, or we should want it all. Like I am feeling completely overwhelmed by, um, I, look, it's enough that I'm trying to keep my business going and my kids doing some okay. cool work. <laughs> yeah. um, but then I and then I'm following influencers who are telling me to use this time to uh, meditate and do yoga and think about the things that I just can't I can't think about those things. 
I don't have time. And so one of, that's one of the expectations I've had to let go is that this is free time. This doesn't mm-hmm. feel like free time. Um, but Lauren, is because you are the expert in um, equality, right? In quality in the workplace. What are the expectations that we have to set at work with our bosses, with our partners? So I get I get really practical about this stuff really quickly because I think, you know, we can all sort of have, we all come from our own place of like whatever degree of privilege we may have in terms of our expectations of, you know, our deliverables. Um, but you you have to kind of think of things in terms of like, what I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, and so like this is okay. This is exactly what I'm talking about. I am not a person who typically loses my train of thought. My brain right now is so full. Cool. We were just talking about this in the warm up mm-hmm. for this call before we even got on. Sarah, you were saying that you know you. I really- couldn't remember the name of Minneapolis. Is it exactly? Is it's it like one of the many words I've forgotten today? But and so and so, I am just going to live this transparency right now <laughs> and tell you that I had a thought and it totally flew out of my head. I have I have become a person who now wakes up in the middle of the night to see if I can get the spot for the grocery delivery. And believe me, that impacts sleep. It impacts all kinds of things. Anyway, in terms of what you're actually able to accomplish at work. The, the sort of practical advice that I have been giving the women who I coach, I coach, um, so in my like normal life, I coach women who are coming back to work after having a baby to help them sort of make that transition successfully in a way that lets them sustain their career and hopefully even be able to make some change in their workplaces for the positive. And one bit of advice that I'm giving to them is um, just as, as a takeaway is you are probably, if you're trying to work from home while also caring for a family, you might be able to receive information all day long. You probably do have your phone in your hand. You might be able to like read the Slack, read the emails. What you probably don't have copious time to do is sit down and actually type at your keyboard and produce thoughts, produce words, move things forward. So if you can be really clear with, and, and this even this requires a degree of, of agency that, that many, 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 many women in particular do not have in the workplace, but to whatever degree, whatever degree you have it, grab it. And be clear with everybody you work for and people who work for you and people who work around you about what two times during the day are going to be your output times and help them understand, oh, here we go, busting in child right now. <laughs> No, it's okay, sweetie. Do you need me urgently? No. Okay. Oh, okay. My my fifth grader got a lot of homework done. That's great. Good job. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Okay. More than half of the weekend's homework. That's amazing. Great. That's really good. Okay. See, success. <laughs> anyway, be really clear about like which two times during the day they can expect to have output from you. So it's fine. And you want to say to them, like, I am receiving. I, of course, we're all working all the time in many, many, many ways. I am, I am listening. I'm taking everything in and I'm digesting because I think that there is a tendency right now to everybody, you know, cover your butt and triple CC people you might not, might not otherwise include on messages and then everyone feels obligated to respond. And very often if you wait two or three hours until something has sort of synthesized or digested through all the people who need to sort of like think about it, and then it's your time to produce something. If you can know that you can get your childcare covered for like two 90 minute blocks or whatever the equivalent is for your work, but also have sort of released yourself of the expectation that you're not doing it all day long and that like you know that okay at two o'clock I'm gonna have that time and everybody around me knows that they don't they're not worried about hearing back from me until then that can be a huge relief. Um, all right I love that setting boundaries not just expectations. Yeah boundaries and boundaries that, that make you feel comfortable and don't distract you all day long by that feeling of like oh, that thing I'm not doing that thing I'm not doing like no you're gonna do it you have a time for it it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah, the, you yeah. you sit in two um, very important chairs. One, as an incredibly powerful, smart, ambitious, very busy woman yourself, but also as the leader of a business where all of your clients, all of your customers are smart and ambitious and probably overwhelmed by the expectations of work and life at this moment. Um, Talk about, let's talk about your, it's easier, let's talk about business first. 
what are the things that you're hearing from your network, from your community, from your customers um, that, that they need help with, that they're struggling with? Yeah, um, so uh, I'd just like to start off by saying thank you. Thank you to the Girl Scouts for having me. I was a very um, delinquent junior Girl Scout at one point, um, but my dad worked in the State Department. So we we moved around every three to four years. We were going from different country to different country. And um, it was always in many ways my like connection to America because uh, the Girl Scouts have overseas troops that are usually operated by people in the military or people in the State Department. And so anyway, um, I have a, a very special place in my heart for the Girl Scouts. Um, and yeah, so so my company, it's called MM Lafleur. Um, we are a, a, a company, a clothing company, a fashion company for working women. And so um, I really say purposefully working women and not um, work wear because I think um, what our, our brand has really been about is supporting women um, in, in, in the work they do, whatever that work may be. Of course, some people go to the office. Um, not many of us are going to the office, but but a lot of we have a lot of women who are freelancers who work from home. Um, it's a it's a variety of lifestyles, and if anything, I think COVID nineteen is just going to escalate that movement where um, fewer of us are going to be tied to a a you know a, a cubicle of sorts, um, and we'll be working from all sorts of different places. So I think this movement was already happening, and it's going to continue happening. Um, is that good? Is freedom from the office is it good for women? I think it is, but maybe, maybe, maybe there's an argument it's not. You know, it's a, I, so my mom is also an entrepreneur and I think one of the reasons that she started her company, she started her own business was because my dad, all, you know, every three, four, three to four years, he would get relocated and her career, you know, she was one of the first Japanese women to go to Columbia Business School and get her MBA. But, um, you know, she would say herself, her career was very much stunted because, because my dad had to move all the time. And um, part of the reason she started her job was because her company was because she wanted that flexibility. And, you know, this is back in the 1990s um, when she when she actually, I guess, late 1980s, when she first started talking about it. And she said, you know, um, her company by, basically is all all female. And she said in in my uh, company, she says this in Japanese, but um there is no distinction between work life and personal life. So like I would just call her in the office, you know, at, at 10 a.m. Um, uh, and, and she she would take it. She would always take it. And, um, you know, she has a lot of employees who are caring for elder their elderly parents. And that's totally part of the deal. And um, I think she was in many ways ahead of that time. And I got to I got to see that, I think, through her lens. And so, you know, now so we're, we're a company um, we do we do we do have an office. Um, you know, it, we've got uh, 250 people all together. But um we i think we we have just been inc like way more flexible in terms of um when people choose to work from home i agree like generally i think not having not uh forcing people to come to the office is, is generally a good thing of course there, there are moments where you just want to bring everyone together in the same room but um it, during this you know crisis like my, my head of fabric r d like I, I need her so badly her expertise is incredibly important she's in touch with all of our mills in italy talking about their shutdown when are we going to be able to get the fabric um you know uh so so she's her her skills and her expertise is essential um but her husband has COVID 19 and so has relocated to a different house and she has a five-month-old baby and a three-year-old girl, four-year-old girl, who she's taking care of by herself. And so when she shows up, um, I'm just, first of all, grateful <laughs> that she shows up. Uh, and she almost always has her baby um, in, in her lap. And sometimes she's feeding her while she's talking to us. And you know what? That's that's a-okay by me. I'm just so grateful that she's there because what I need her for is, is her expertise in her brain. Like, I don't, I don't need her to be, you know, putting her professional self forward in this moment. And so um, that's a that's a very roundabout way of saying, like, I think actually, like getting people away from the office has been so liberating for a lot of women. Um, I will just add, though, I have also seen through my girlfriends that the opposite can also play out. So, um, you know, one of my closest girlfriends, a college roommate of mine, her husband works at a hedge fund. And the expectation just there is that of course, you're not the primary caretaker. How could you be? Um, so uh, you must have a nanny or you must have a partner who is the primary caretaker. In her case, she's not. Um, but um, after 
in some consideration, she actually just decided to leave her job. Um, there, there are other reasons that played into it, but I think, um, I, you know, I kind of said, could, couldn't, um, couldn't he sit there with the baby? And, and she was like, that's just not the company culture. Like the expectation is that, you know, uh, when when the clock strikes nine, like you're on your laptop and your family life kind of goes away. And so I do think a lot of it is dependent on, on company culture. Like, you know, it, it really, it um, it's going to have to come from the people at the top to say, I expect to see you with your children or whoever it is that you need to care for on your camera screen. Um, don't be shy about it. There's so much in there to unpack that you just said. <laughs> I want to get to like all of it. I, there's so many threads. The first thread though, is, as you were talking about, um, the the disintegration between work and life right that like the, the demand has always been i want to bring my whole self to work but now you're bringing your work to your whole self and it's mm -hmm. like take it or leave it right i love the idea that you're that you're like i want your brain and whatever else is happening is not important there was a good question that came in though that i thought was really smart um but i want to get back to that thing about equality at home but the question was so smart was like what if your if child care is not your concern are you suddenly on the clock all the time? And I think that that's a really interesting question that now that maybe in the work-life balance formula mix that we're trying to deal with now, that it's as if you are not valuable unless you are working and that anything you're doing that isn't working is just a distraction from that. And it's something that we've talked about I've talked about a lot about this idea of burnout, right? That you can get so overwhelmed with feeling like you are only valuable when you are working and that the, that your self-worth is being um, determined by the number of tasks that you can tick off in a day. Um, and I really wanna talk about that for a second, this idea that um, work-life balance is not for only when you have children, right? That, we're, that you were, and not the balance part, but the life part, bringing your work and your life together um, mm -hmm that you are a valuable human being outside of work, right? That it is not only because of work and that you don't need to tick off all the boxes all the time. Yeah, that's something, uh, something I talk about a lot. And um, just that uh, very often, you know, the work that I do is centered around moms and changing workplace culture at this moment of coming back to work after baby. However, the whole point of it is actually to make better for work better for human beings and very often the sort of most visible personal life need that we see in a workplace is a big pregnant belly but when we solve things equitably for moms we're actually making things better for everybody's personal life or we should be there was a an article in the harvard business review fairly recently that before before pre <laughs> back in our old life um that talked about how any um any policies around flex time should be need blind. They shouldn't have to, you know, they shouldn't be at all about if you're a parent. And I think that, you know, a lot of the sort of internal um, biases that we all have and that we carry into our workplaces as managers, as colleagues, even, you know, our biases against ourselves are really at risk of being exacerbated right now. And so, the advice that I give to um, any managers that I that I counsel and talk to is really try not to make this a you know try not to make things better just for parents and remember that everybody in some way or another has a caregiving capacity. Sometimes when I'll do when I do a workshop, I'll ask not you know tell me about who your kids are and what job you do, but tell me about what job you do and tell me who you take care of in your life. And sometimes it's kids. And sometimes even for the parents, it is like, you know, it's, oh, I, I have this elder care responsibility. I have a sibling who has, you know, some needs. I have a, a, an older child who has special needs, or I have a mental health challenge myself. You know, like there is every single person who is on every Zoom call that you're on, every one of those squares, everybody has something. And so I think we have to treat people who aren't parents with the exact same flexibility and respect that in this moment is suddenly being given is a strong verb, but, you know, is, is being recognized as a need um, like it never has before. Mm -hmm. The things that keep you going and sustain you during moments of turmoil and stress are the same, whether they are, whether you are a parent or not. And one of the things I want to talk about is the power of community. And um, for me, it is sisterhood. I, I um, run a network of women who are helping each other achieve and succeed in all parts of their lives. 
Um, but those, the connections are the most important things for our success. And I think because we are all feeling, we are literally isolated. Um, I wanna talk about the ways in which we can continue to build community and to shore up the support we need. Sarah, will you talk a little bit about what um, your members are doing and have done in this time? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think one of the things that, that I love about um, our customers is, uh, well, you know, I'm also obviously incredibly grateful for every purchase they make, especially during this time. <laughs> But um, they 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 have a lot to say. They have very um, deep lives, and um, we used to the primary way we used to bring them together is actually through our um, our blog, our digital magazine called the M Dash. Um, has close to a million subscribers. It's been an incredibly powerful tool for us to just bring our 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 customers together, um, and, and we've got a lot of non-customers who subscribe to it too. But as soon as COVID started, it was pretty clear that we were going to be staying at home for, for a while. We launched a Slack channel for our customers um, and they uh, they just started talking to each other, networking with each other, um, sharing recipes with each other, childcare tips with each other. And it, it just created this instant community of, of thousands of women. And we didn't think it would take off in such a big way. But I think a lot of us are, you know, we've lost our our work wives, our work husbands, and um, sometimes you just want someone to chat to or, or, you know, frankly, just entertain you and keep take your mind off of things. And so this is, the Slack channel has really evolved into that. We have this one customer who's, I mean, she just cracks me up. She takes photos of herself in MM clothes, um, uh, copying the funny poses that our models do. And I mean, <laughs> totally satirical and she sends them out and she you know she has one shot where she's like throwing her leg in the air and she's like i threw my hip out trying to shoot this one um but you know she's just sharing these funny photos from her home um one of our one of the slack channels is called mm lafur uh my company's mm lafleur uh so it, on mm lafur like they're sharing photos of their dogs and cats and, and and various pets um and and so it's been just amazing seeing seeing these women come together really we do we do very little in these channels um and, you know, there's very little community management. They're just talking to each other and networking with each other. And that's just been something really wonderful for, for us to see. And what is your personal tribe, like the group of women or men and women that you rely on to help get mm -hmm. you through? Definitely my college roommates. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I, we WhatsApp constantly. Um, and it's we're, we're at very different stages of our lives. Um, one one has three kids. One has uh, a a newborn baby. Um, one is a, a surgeon and um, dating. We're trying to date in this in this very interesting time. Um, I'm pregnant, and and um, you know we thought in some ways uh, like you. I think naturally there there are differences in life stages that kind of can drive you apart. But um, I think the four of us we just we've we're, we're thick as thieves, and and, and um. We, we just joke around with each other a lot. Um, it's not maybe your most typical, like super supportive female um, friendship. I mean, it is absolutely that, but we're more like siblings. We're always just like pulling each other's legs. So um, I, I'm always happy to see like a WhatsApp message pop up on my cell phone. Um, and, and that's really just been a huge source of support for me. It's just a reminder that you are not a robot, right? That there are other threads of your life. And I think that that is so important. Um, particularly when you're feeling the pressure and being overwhelmed by the expectations and the responsibility that someone loves you and supports you because you had some silly times together as opposed to like you owe them a PL statement or whatever. <laughs> totally. <is>. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think bringing out those moments of humanity in each other, especially during this time, is so important. Um, and so, like, w my executive team recently, you know, we, I mean, just transparently, like my business has gone through really, really hard times. And so um, we've had to furlough some of our retail staff. Um, emotionally, it's been so, so trying. And um, we do these like weekly mental health check-ins with each other. It's not it's not such a rigid thing. We just say like, you know, how's everyone doing the, uh, doing today? And we had one session where, uh, well, I ended up in tears, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think just remembering, I think, there, there's such a need to make decisions quickly and act quickly because time is of the essence. And if there's anything that COVID has taught us, like the, a week can make a big difference. 
Um, and so we're, we're trying to make these decisions at rapid speed, but it also comes with an enormous pressure and enormous stress. And so I think just remembering to be human with each other has been has been really important. That's amazing. I want to talk to you, Lauren, about one of the one of the threads from earlier in the conversation, which is about um, shoring up equality at home. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite conversations that I've ever had with you is, and like mm -hmm. you frankly um, opened my mind in such a big way. We talked about um, uh, parental leave, about um, about fathers taking leave and mm -hmm. how that is so key to equality in your household and at work. But it says that, I will summarize for you. It says that, um, your job is just as important as my job, and we are both gonna take time away from our job to help get through this initial transition of when you have a baby. However, one of the things, the crazy um, upsetting stats that I've been hearing is mm -hmm. that a large percentage of women, a larger percentage of women than men are talking about stepping away from their jobs in the face of COVID for whatever reason. And maybe it is taking care of children, but maybe as you said, there's other people that you take care of, right? If you're taking care of a, of a parent. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I wanna talk about how do we continue to see equality, right? To not, and, and it's a complicated, I, it's a complicated thing to even articulate because you want to say, that you are not just valuable because of the way you work, but and we don't want to give up all of the gains that we've made right. in the workplace for working for working women. Period. For women. Period. Yeah. I mean, I will say right off the bat, I don't have I don't have all the answers to that question. Oh my God! So my door is open, and now everything is very loud. So I apologize if you guys are hearing <laughs> back. Um, I don't have all the answers. You know, I do know, um, referring back to the conversation that you and I had had a while ago about um, parental leave, that it very, very often, for reasons that are not, you know, our fault, um, sets up all kinds of patterns, even in the most um, progressive couples or well intended, um, equality minded couples, simply because there's a lot of societal pressure. Mm -hmm. um, because of breastfeeding also, because if, you know, your body is producing milk for this baby, that is the one thing so far, at least that, um, your partner, if your partner is a man cannot do, um, but mostly because of the gender wage gap, you know, so very practically speaking, we make a lot of decisions based on who makes more money, who has potential to make more money and who has our healthcare benefit. And so right now, I mean, I can't think of, of a situation in which that would feel more important. So as much as I would love to say, make everything equal at home, you know, my own situation is that I, for years, was the breadwinner when my husband was in medical school and residency. I then left that career to start my own business, where for a couple of years, I made significantly less money and he was the breadwinner because he was through his training and had become a full-fledged physician. Um, finally, I basically caught up with him and we were kind of even. And so it was, it was just psychically a lot easier to think of things as more balanced in terms of who's going to do what, because, you know, our work was sort of equally meaningful. Our work was bringing in the same amount of support to our family and boom, in the last six weeks, you know, like, like Sarah said, you know, a huge portion of my business has fallen away. It's a lot of live speaking events. It's a lot of consulting for budgets that are getting slashed. And I do have, you know, things. Competitions. I know, I mean, it's, we're in a similar boat, I'm sure. There's, there's a lot that thankfully, you know, clients who have stuck with me and there's always a need for support for, for moms in the workplace. So I've been able to maintain my business somewhat. However, it's in the context of, living in New York, having these two kids at home, not having any caregivers besides ourselves. And my husband, by the way, is a doctor. So he was gone in the beginning of this. He was gone 12, 14 hours a day working at a big hospital. He then was able to move a bunch of his patients to another hospital that he's been commuting to. We bought a car. We didn't have a car. We bought a car so he could commute and do this. Significant, you know, expense at a time when, you know, budgets are tight. And then he got sick. And so he locked himself in our bedroom for eight days 
and then we continued to distance with him in a mask and not eating with us for you know seven more days and none of this is, is a crimey river story it was mild i love telling that he got sick and that everything is okay because thank god he's okay the kids and i are okay and it can be mild and you don't hear a lot of those stories but thankfully it was however you know my work is so much about women's equality and what kind of life am i living right now like thankfully i'm able to do calls like this and and you know be a part of, of such an amazing message but i am living like it is 1957. i cook every meal i do all of the cleaning he's now back at work um, and doing an incredibly important job and comes home at night and you know helps wash the dishes thankfully but like it's all on me so i think what's important and i'm rambling a little bit but i think what's important is not necessarily that we make all the right decisions right now in terms of equality, but that we be able to talk about why we're making them now in this moment to be clear that they're only temporary. So back to maternity versus paternity leave, which I hate to sort of be gendered about it, but just in terms of splitting up who's getting what primary caregiver, secondary caregiver, whatever it is. Um, you know, I understand couples where the mother might have more access to more leave than her partner has or might need to take more of it, but you have to be really clear with each other about not setting up patterns that are going to last. And one thing that can be very helpful in this, that situation is if mom takes more maternity leave than dad takes paternity leave, when mom does go back to work, if she does, that dad then takes over for a period of time, even or dad or partner, I should say, even if it is only, you know, a week, but to be home with that baby, let that baby get a little bit older before they go into childcare, um, let dad or partner have that time on their own with the baby to really learn things, you know, in the trenches, but also just as importantly for mom to realize, hey, it doesn't have to all be me. This person who I chose to be my partner is, so capable and so loving and has an amazing bond with our child and like i can go off and do my job and in fact there's actually there's a study there was a study out of um, i think it was germany but i'm actually not positive that showed that for every month of paternity leave a dad takes his wife's lifetime his wife's earnings four years later are up by seven percent and that's not because of the money she made in that month it's because of the patterns that were established so take all of that in the context of what individually as families we're dealing with now. And I think there's lessons to extrapolate that could ultimately be helpful, primarily about communication. If we're making choices because it's the right thing for our family in this moment, and we're thinking, leaning more towards equity as opposed to equality, like that's okay, but let's just all talk about it and acknowledge it. And maybe even do something as deliberate as put a date on the calendar six weeks from now, three months from now, six months from now, to both sit down and look at it and assess. And aside, huge aside, all hail single moms. This is in single parents, single dads too. Like this is an almost impossible thing to do for single parents, some of whom I'm coaching right now. And I just, I, you know, it's a privilege to even have a partner who is a resource for you. So you better use them if you've got them. So first of all, I'm gonna make an appointment with my husband, put it on the calendar for three months from now. Um, but Lauren, that was so helpful. I'm taking notes. <laughs> I need really. to take my advice sometimes. <laughs> I think your <laughs> single moms is so crucial. And when I brought up the point about community and building your tribe and building your sisterhood, um, that's what's going to sustain you, right? That that at, at, that no matter who you are, what is stressful for you. But if you are a single parent who is trying to figure out all of this on your own. Yeah. I mean, I think she's doing her work at uh, three in the morning. So that's when she can get her, that's when she can get her work done. Um, yeah. That, that's what we need. We need our tribe. We need our sisterhood. We need our community. And so yeah. to be there with them and for them. Um, okay, Sarah, you, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get rid of them. Is that our noise? It's me. It's me. I'm sorry. My notifications went back on. And right, so it's me. You for a minute. You can <laughs> Yeah. Sarah, you said something in our prep call, which I thought was so interesting, which was preparing your business for the worst, right? That dealing with the worst case scenario um, helps alleviate some of your anxiety. Can you talk about that philosophy? Because I think that's a really important thing for us in our personal lives and in our work lives. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, when, um, when initially we, we saw 
kind of the impact of COVID maybe earlier than a lot of other Americans because so many of our partners are overseas and specifically we have a lot of partners out in China. So we saw our factories in China shutting down, gosh, in late January, early February, I think, you know, late January, we, we knew it was going to be a problem. But at that point, we were still like, oh, well, you know, like, that's over the Pacific. It's not going to, like, we never thought it would get to this. Um, and uh, I think a few weeks later, when it, when it became clear that it wasn't even a question of if, but when it was going to, it was going to hit, we started uh, scenario planning, which is, you know, what most companies would do in any, in this situation, you just start thinking, okay, what's the impact going to be on your business? We had six scenarios and the sixth scenario um, the, the, what actually happened in, in reality far surpassed the worst case scenario that we had planned for. And so that was, that was a huge shock. And, and all of this was changing in real time. We knew so little about COVID-19. So, you know, I don't, I don't at all like fault anyone for, for this, but, um, I think what part of that taught me to do is, is like, okay, let's really think about what the worst case scenario is now. So, you know, I hear some stories about maybe things are starting to open up in the South. Um, you know, is that actually a good decision? Uh, that, you know, that people, people are, are really conflicted about it. And, um, and there's this kind of artificial, well, come June, you know, stores will start to open up. And, but the truth is actually, we don't know if anything's gonna come back in the summer or if anything's going to come back in the fall. Actually, I think Dr. Fauci was just quoted saying coronavirus will be a thing in the fall and will be coupled with flu season. And, and so now we're actually saying, okay, like maybe there's a possibility that things don't even really start to come back until middle of 2021. And when you think that, it's in some ways so depressing. But I think for me, yes. what... <laughs> <laughs> it just it makes you kind of... Right, right. But there, there's, I think for... Um, you know, I, I I think of myself as a numbers person, and I will say when I see when I see the real numbers come in versus my forecast, and the real numbers are significantly worse than what I forecasted for, that is a terrible feeling. Whereas if I set my expectations low and we come in above, I think to myself like, oh, that was that was that was a good week. Um, and and there's something deeply psychological about. I know I never thought I would say this, but Financial planning is one of the most psychological um, uh, processes I think that really exists in business. And, and, and I've really, I think I, I've tried to take that lesson and just apply it generally in my life and saying like, okay, like worst case scenario, things are not gonna come back till the second half of 2021. What does that look like? And just sit, set my base like line expectations there. Um, I think that's just been helpful for me emotionally as I think also about like just having a baby in this climate. like. I don't know, like, I, I, you know, now things in New York are changing. So I think your partner actually can be there, but maybe my partner can't be there and my husband. Uh, and, and so what does that look like? Um, and just kind of mentally preparing that and then be pleasantly surprised if things don't turn out that way. I think it's an amazing attitude that rather than um, duck, hide, pretend, put on a, po we always want to put on like the positive outlook and we want to like, we want to paint a rosy picture and be optimistic, but that if you're being realistic and that you can look at the worst case scenario, I love that. Like be pleasantly surprised if it doesn't come true. Yeah. I think that that's, yeah. I think that's good. It's a, um, hard, it's a hard impulse to tamp down. I think this generation, and I mean, honestly, the generation above me, the generation below me and my own generation, have been so trained to have the highest expectations of ourselves. And so it's a really hard thing. It's a brave thing. And it's hard to think of it as being brave to lower your expectations. But actually, it might make the end result more achievable. Yeah. I think one of the, I, I think rather than lowering your expectations, right, this idea of like there's been a total reset um, has been something that's really been on my mind, especially because. Um, I have always been such a um, ambitious. I mean, you know, my whole business is built around women's ambition and how can we keep going and how can we keep striving? And to literally be forced to stay home, to retool my business. I was in the middle of building a live events business um, and uh, has really made me 
I guess I said I didn't want to do any self-evaluation, but I guess I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all need it. It's actually a deeply psychological exercise, but it's actually made me pay very careful attention to what we value in ourselves and the way we and the way we um, we think about what makes us successful as a person and happy as a person and and. Um, and I really don't mean that in a woo-woo way. I mean it in a, um, in a why am I, why am I doing this? And and is it okay to not fill up my bank account the way I thought I was? To not have the awards the way I thought were gonna come? Um, to hustle in a different way than I had expected? You know, and to and those are the facts of life. Um, as opposed to feeling like disappointed about them, right? It's a reset for everyone to know that everybody is in the same boat. So I had promised um, that this would be a nuts and bolts discussion. That everyone who is watching, um, we have a big crowd out there actually, I've just looked at the number, um, that everybody is watching is gonna walk away with um, actionable tips. What can you do the minute that you get off this call the minute that you wake up tomorrow morning, what do we need to do to to shore up our um, our sense of self in the face of work life crashing? Um, so let's do a quick lightning round. Lauren, three things. Three things. I brought my sticky notes. One, integrate your lists. If you have a work to do list that you're working from, and then you also have a mental list of all the things that have to happen in your personal life right now to make your home run, your family run the way you want it to, or just make you be okay, put it all in one place. It all counts right now, it all should, and when it's all visible in front of you, you're not gonna spend brain space worrying about what are you forgetting about in this moment. Like it all counts, anything you check off should count right now because you're obviously working weird hours and you know taking care of yourself and your home and your family weird hours too, and so it's all okay all the time. I have a very like retro notebook. My notebook is like I like a, I like a check mark. I I like a box with the item, and then I check through the box and I slash. I like I like it all <laughs> off the list. If I've done the thing and it didn't go on the list, I will write it on the list and then scratch it out. It's all good. It's all, whatever whatever makes you feel good, including um, like the groceries you're thinking about at three o'clock in the morning. Oh yes yes, and then okay, so maybe this actually counts as the second thing make that list as visible to everybody else who is in your home right now as you possibly can. I mean, we've started writing down, we have a, um, my kids are, my kids are older, my kids are eight and 11, so they can read and they can participate in helping around the home. And like one enormous silver lining for me is that they actually seem to want to. It might be because their mother looks a little bit vulnerable right now and like she needs help and so they're helping. Um, but we have a dry erase board on, um, that's just a weekly calendar that I got on Amazon a while ago on our refrigerator and you know, it includes, it used to include after school activities. Now it includes things like what's for dinner every night. So like, we're not going to have any objections. You know, everybody can see it in front of them. If there's some reason that they really want tacos on Tuesday, we're going to like, okay, tell mom now, tell me now. Um, so make it all really visible. You know, the kids now know that Wednesday is cleaning day, you know, and so they know to strip their beds on Wednesday. And it's, it is, it makes me feel like it would take me two seconds to strip their beds. Knowing they're doing it makes me feel like, the other thing I can check off is like, I'm doing good mothering right now because they're learning to do this stuff and <laughs> their wives will thank me one day. Um, that's the second thing. The third thing is, you know, we're so um, deliberate about who we make phone calls and Zoom calls with right now. And so I think it's important not to forget to not to forget that a lot of sort of the social business development and also just like what we get out of work, if you're going into a workplace, is the more casual, hi, hello in the hallway, stopping by somebody's cube, that like whatever your proverbial water cooler conversations were, those are probably gone right now. And if there's any way to preserve them, and I don't mean that you need to set up a Zoom call with like all, you know, all the new parents necessarily in your office and because then that person's also going to have to you know be a part of like the associates like all, all of these sort of extra 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 calls that are meant to make people feel included actually can just take up a ton of time particularly for the introverts who may not want to participate but if you can make a group of like just one-on-one -on -one, make a 10-minute phone call like on the phone not even visible 
if you can do and not you know, transactional not like yeah. hey i need this thing from mm -hmm. you no but not at all just, just like hey i was thinking about you and you can even say if we were in the office together i know we wouldn't be in meetings right now but like I would say hi to you and I'd be so curious to know how you're doing. And so I just like, if you have time, like I'd love to chat for five minutes. They're gonna think you have an agenda, you don't. It's gonna be like lovely and it's gonna help you cultivate these relationships that you're gonna wanna have back once we are all back. I just had such a flashback, Lauren, to when you and I worked in an office together and how yes. many to like walk down the hall and see you and like, yes, we should do, we Wait, should do you that. You to work in an office together? We long did like a long time ago. Oh my god, I did not. Know that. I was Anne's assistant for a few months. What? I don't remember that. I don't remember that. <laughs> I was. I assisted like six senior editors, and you were one of them. I, I, I mean, you were like probably one year older than I am, but I was like, oh, she's amazing. <laughs> I like it. All right, I like your to-do list, Sarah. What's your lightning round? Three things that we have to do the minute we get off this call. Yeah. Um. Well, the first thing I would schedule is uh, if, if you uh, work with other people, um, I really recommend this mental health check. Maybe you just want to suggest it to your boss saying that like, this is something that's really, I heard helpful um, and, and actually creating an opportunity for you to be human with, with your coworkers. Um, you'll be surprised, I think. And, and the tip is you have to go first. You have to suggest it and then you have to go first because the first person who goes really sets, sets the stage and if you can be transparent you'll you'll be amazed what you will get in return um and i think tensions can run really high right now in the conversations we're having especially if you're talking about cost cutting or layoffs or furloughs or whatever they may be and just really understanding where the other person is coming from look like you know i i know my ceo she hadn't slept in three days because she has a three-year-old toddler who's barely or two-year-old toddler who's teething um and who uh, is, is like just she can't sleep um and, and just like knowing that she's in that headspace it just it creates so much room for empathy that i think can be hard sometimes over a zoom call or a conference call so um i definitely recommend that um, the second one, I, you know, this is something I've just been doing for myself personally, and I realize I'm I'm the childless one, so I get the luxury of a little more a little more me time. Um, but uh, when uh, it, it depends when the day ends. Today's going to be a little bit late, but generally my day day gets to wrap up around seven seven thirty. Um, and my my husband makes a mocktail for me, and he makes himself a martini, and that's the end of the day. And um, I think just when like seemingly like the the days are never ending and work and life you know to Anne's point they just like they're all colliding and spilling into each other for me it's a, it's the the holding the mocktail in hand is a signal for me to just like step away from the laptop because otherwise you could just be sitting there forever um we so we do that at my house there's yeah. there's a happy hour where I say to my husband, how was your day today? And we say to the kids, how was school today? Even though we've been in each other's <laughs> right. day. Yes. Like there's still, you still want to keep some of those structures of your day. Correct. I think they're, yeah, a moment of um, reflection. Right, and like just a, a little ceremonial thing. And for me, my 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 mocktail is um, my imaginary uh, a gin and tonic um it's just tonic with a lot of lime water but it's enough to just make me think like the day's done um so so that's that and then i you know the last thing i, I have to say this because you know i run mm lafleur but getting dressed in the morning um i spent the first few days i was like god this is kind of amazing i can just like walk around with my sweatpants all day and then i think after like day four i was just like god this is really not good for my sanity and I um I started dressing. I'm still kind of the makeup thing. I, I still haven't really gotten around to. Though I did wear a little makeup for you today, so <laughs> hope you appreciate it. Um, but you know, I just even putting on these earrings for me, like I, I just uh, I feel a little better. And then I have this process also of undressing at the end of the day, which also signals to me that the day is over. Um, so you know, I think dress up, not not necessarily you know for anyone else, but but yourself, uh, because I I think it does make a difference. I think it signals that you're that, that we're not in a sloppy, lazy, oh my God, overwhelming, right? It it shows that you're like on top of things. Still, I mean, I'm wearing slippers. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the, rest of the, outfit, the rest of the outfit came together. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing my girl scout green. <laughs> I'm wearing my girl scout green. Um, 
but I think you're right. The the as much as we can hold on to the rituals of the day that keeps everything from turning into one big mess. Mm -hmm. um, the last piece of advice that I will give, though, is to embrace the mess. That um, if we try too hard to wrangle this crazy situation into something that feels tiny and manageable, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. And mm -hmm. that the mess can be momentum and energy to keep things moving forward. And that sometimes when everything gets thrown on the floor, you're like, oh, wait, I forgot about this great idea that I've been working on, and this is a new thing. So to look for the opportunities and the possibilities rather than feeling like, and feeling like the mess is going to get you somewhere better rather than mm -hmm. feeling the mess is going to suck you under um, is my one takeaway is to embrace Great the advice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know if we have time for, I think we have time for one, I don't know if I'm getting a note from the Girl Scout organizers for a couple of um, questions. Um, I, we've gotten some great comments, right? Somebody po posted that they are having a mental health day um, for all of their staff. No emails, no meetings. Concentrate on reflecting on life and recentering. I love that idea. Oh, what um, a great boss, whoever you are. Yeah, and I think that's amazing. I think that's just something we should do whenever we can, right? Is to be mm -hmm. kind to ourselves and not. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really object to is when we talk about self-care is like a mani and a massage is like self-care is being aware of your triggers of your mood and taking the steps that you need to um, give yourself the peace and the zen. Mm. Um, this one feels like this is perfect for Lauren, the question that just popped in. What structures or tools do you use to improve your spousal and or family communication? Oh, okay. So here's a good one. So this is, again, this is, this is something that I advise under normal circumstances, but I don't know why it couldn't also work now. Um, the Sunday night comparing of the calendars. If you're in a dual, a dual working family and you need to sort of like, you can sit down every Sunday night and the first couple of times it's kind of painful and then it just becomes habit and it actually becomes a relief but to sort of carve out like, okay, look, you look at your calendar, I'll look at my calendar. And what are the times during this week that like, if the proverbial crap hits the fan, that like, I can't be on. Like I am gonna be pitching this super important client. I'm gonna be giving a presentation, what, whatever, whatever your equivalent is, like call that time and make sure your partner knows about it and cover it for each other so that you've already claimed it. It's also a way that like, you know, in normal circumstances, if it's cold season and like, you know, the kids go to a daycare where if they have a fever at all, they can't go. Is this whole week gonna be one that I cover or that you cover or who's taking Tuesday, who's taking Wednesday? And very often you don't even need the cover, but just being able to um, claim it and to have that visibility of like what you do all day long that actually is important to you and important to your family's security um, really goes a long way. I put my important meetings on my husband's calendar. I like. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see. My husband's a psychiatrist. I can't share his calendar because I can't like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I, but I do think that's a good the the naming and claiming it is super important. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thank you guys so much for this conversation. Um, uh, Girl Scout network i hope that this was valuable to you um you know where to find us on social media and i would love to hear from anybody who was out here listening um, and to be in touch in other ways that we can be helpful to each other i am the biggest believer in the power of community the girl scouts are shoring up community for generations to come um, and these kinds of conversations are crucial to have um, and so i thank you I think we're going to turn it back to the Girl Scout team. Thanks, Anne. Thank you so much, everyone. It was so lovely to have you with us. Thank and thank you. you, everyone, for inviting the Girl Scout Network into your homes. We'll be hosting a wide variety of campfire chats, so be sure to stay up to date with our offerings on girlscouts.org slash campfire chats. Tune in Sunday and Wednesday when we'll have two more baking classes with Sonam Sunday a winner of the Food Network's Girl Scout Cookie Challenge, and you won't want to miss those. One more fun piece of news to share before signing off is, of course, about Girl Scout cookies. 
Girl Scout Cookie Cares allows you to buy boxes online and have them shipped safely. You can also donate them directly to first responders on the front lines of COVID-19. The link was posted in the chat log and it will be included in the follow-up email to today's event. Your generosity will also help support the 1.7 million Girl Scouts depending on the cookie program to fund life-changing girl-led programs, experiences, and learning. And I think that's a pretty sweet deal. Thank you for joining us this evening and we look forward to welcome you back at our next event. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.